All right, well, Jacqueline, this is going to be fun. You know, I want to start here. I mean, you have built and sold two companies before the age of 30. 35 and you look 29 so that's kind of jamming me up by the way love it love it <laughs> and I, I love how you talk about founders entrepreneurs and how they they need an unnerving amount of drive I just published a book called dynamic drive so I got to tell you that word really kind of hit home with me what does that word mean to you yeah, it's funny. I Someone told me once, they're like, you really have an unnerving amount of drive. And it really stuck with me after they told me that because I, I realized like that's the secret ingredient you need in founders. It's not necessarily like... Oh, oh wait, yeah, what's going on here? Someone else is in. Do you know who that is? Oh, oh hi, we're already recording. No worries. Can you, oh, is she dropping? Okay, cool. Um, Sorry about that. It's okay, I'll start. No, so someone once told me you have an unnerving amount of drive and it was, it really stuck with me after they had told me that. And really what I realized was, was that's a secret ingredient that makes a founder great, that makes an entrepreneur great, is that you really have to have that drive that keeps you going day in and day out. Because as we all know, it is not easy to be an entrepreneur. You have to have that drive that gets you through those down moments. Where do you think it comes from for you? And, and, and when you think about it, is it something that you were born with? Is it something that you've learned? Is it something you've cultivated? Kind of get me inside of that a little you bit. No, I, I love that question. I think it's partially learned, but I think also it's sort of, kind of comes into play when you have no plan B. I think like oftentimes, you know, a lot of people, you start a company, the stakes maybe are lower for you depending on where you're at. The stakes for me were always very high going into any of these things. Like I moved to cities by myself when I was very young, not knowing a single person. Like I knew I had to make my way in the world. And therefore I think that drive was really derived from that specific experience of really having no plan B, right? I think like if you start thinking in plan B of like, well, I can always go back to corporate. Well, I could always fall back on this you start to lose that drive and you mm -hmm. have to maintain the stakes being high to keep that drive moving. And mm -hmm. I think what keeps the stakes high is that momentum, right? Like, so when things are going really good, like you start to get a little bit addicted to that feeling. And so you keep pushing forward to keep wanting more in that way. You know, it's, it's interesting that you say that because I always talk about how confidence comes from doing, from mm. acting, not, you can't sit in a corner and think your way into it, right? Did you step into this and, and with an enormous amount of confidence or did you fail recover fail recover and sort of strengthen that confidence muscle along the way i think fail recover fail recover so my first company i was very young when i started my first company so i was like 23 so i only had like a few years of corporate experience but i actually had a really great like master class i think in building a business my first job like real job was at a marketing agency two founders starting it up i was employee number four so i got a bird's eye view into what it takes to build a business how to sell how to pitch how to close how to price all these things that like otherwise at the time i didn't think were a big deal but in retrospect building my companies i was so lucky to have that piece of it so i think for me it was one of those things where i kind of naturally grew into this confidence over time because i saw how other people did it i emulated it made it my own over time now that being said was everyone giving me yeses out the gate no of course not you get the nose you learn you move on and i think you have to keep building and again that comes down to that drive in a way to keep going but i realized and i this is something that i think can be translated into different industries and categories what I was building at the time was a marketing agency. Now mm -hmm. at that marketing agency, every client was like, we're trying to get mid 20 year old women to buy our products. And I happened to be a woman in her mid twenties. So I had the expertise. I was the person helping them put the marketing together, pitching the product, but also I was their girl. Mm -hmm. So I really leveraged that to be confident in the room saying, well, I actually know what would interest us or what we would go to or what we would buy or how we would react to that influencer. And I think for those companies, it kind of threw them off, threw them off a little bit. And they're <laughs> like, wait, so I'm gonna pay you a lot of money to do this for me, but also, yeah, you kind of are our audience. So this is really helpful in that way. So 
finding those little bits of confidence that you can latch on to knowing yeah. that you're the right person for the job is important. Yeah, that's awesome. And you talk about ambition and I love how you lean into that word. You lean into it a lot. Mm. You use it in copy quite a bit and it's a word I certainly love. And, and, I, and it, so tell me why that word pops so much inside of all that you do and what it means to you when you think about how to unlock it inside of ourselves. Absolutely. So something that was really interesting, when I first launched Create and Cultivate, the copy that we had on the website was, I think it was something like a conference for um, entrepreneur, uh, female entrepreneurs, blah, 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 blah. What ended up happening was we got a ton of messages that were like, well, you know, I have an Etsy shop. I'm not really an entrepreneur. Well, I have this, you know, side hustle, so I'm not really an entrepreneur. And I was like, no, you are an entrepreneur. And it was funny because I realized women could not relate to being an entrepreneur unless they were extremely successful. So it was this interesting, interesting like mind game where I was like, no, you are an entrepreneur. Now, also what started to happen was we had corporate women attending who were like, I might want to start something one day and no one would latch onto this entrepreneurial word. Now, this is like 10 years ago, so things have changed over time, obviously. But what I realized was women could relate to ambition. Like I have ambition to start a company. I have ambition to have a side hustle. I have ambition to try this product that people say is great to put it out in the market. So ambition really encompassed all the types of women that were coming to our conference in a way that entrepreneur, for whatever reason, didn't. So it was really interesting. And so I've always kind of latched onto this like ambitious woman because it really is just like, I want more out of my business life. And whether that's raising $20 million for a company, selling companies for hundred millions of dollars, or just having a side hustle that lets me pay for great mm. vacations, great. You're an ambitious woman who's an entrepreneur. Yeah. So that's kind of why that word has really kind of stuck with me. You know what's so cool about that is it's not like, I mean, entrepreneur and ambition aren't two words that you would sort of swap out, right? right. And so it's interesting that you unlocked that gap, right, relative to what people were latching onto and what they weren't in order to sort of get a product and, and an offering in front of them that you really knew they needed, but they weren't connecting with in a more traditional way. Exactly. One, one of the things I think is incredibly important in, in drive, I call it dynamic drive in my book, but is, is curiosity. Mm -hmm. And it feels like you got that and unlocked that at some level through a, a bit of curiosity. What role does that play in the way in which you show up for the people that you serve, the people that you lead, the companies that you invest in, the women that you pour into, all of that? Yeah, I mean, you have to be endlessly curious. The world is changing so fast. Business changes so fast. What worked three years ago does not work today. And I think previously that was slowed down a little bit. Now it's like rapid speed. Like if you aren't, right. if you're an e-commerce brand and you're not on TikTok shop or even interested in learning about it, like you're missing the boat. So it, you have to be constantly and endlessly curious. And I think there's uh, a mistake people make where they think, oh, they'll look at me and say like, oh, she's done it. She knows everything. Like that's just not true. Mm -hmm. I knew how to do certain things at a certain time and place to navigate and be very successful. Would that same formula work today? Probably not, right? right? Like so much has changed. So you have to keep up with being endlessly curious about business, about life, about entrepreneurship, about the way the world works. And I learn so much from my investments now than I did from even being an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. Like what's working for you? And I think you have to constantly have these conversations, right? That again, it's like totally new to me. You know, for me, I really focused always on organic growth, community building, um, you know, influencer partnerships, marketing, all those things that kind of came together. Now everyone's like, it's pay to play. We, we just do paid advertising in that way, which was something that, again, I didn't have a ton of experience in, but now I'm endlessly curious on how that works, how my portfolio companies are leveraging this, how my mentees are leveraging it. So I can provide them my perspective on what they should do in the go forward, but also learn from them. So I think that's yeah. important to think about as well as like, you know, your mentors or the people you look up to in entrepreneurship are also still learning right now. Sure. hundred percent. How do you think about your career ambitions and your personal responsibilities and priorities in service of what I think is really broken in the world today is this idea of balance. I think it's a complete, mm -hmm. it's complete BS. It's about alignment, right? Aligning the things that in fact matter most to us and then driving our actions against those things. When you think about that in light of your success, in light of the things that you're juggling personally and professionally, 
What have you learned about balance and alignment and thriving in your career as well? Yeah, so I would say during the bulk of my career, during the most um, sort of chaotic and successful days, balance was out the window for me, to your point. But I was in a very specific point in my life where I wanted to focus on my career because I knew I was on to something big. The momentum was there. And as much as I maybe was burnt out or feeling overwhelmed, I was loving what I was doing in the yep. moment, right? So yep. I look back and like no regrets on that entire experience because I do think that drive, that unnerving amount of attention to detail, that ability to keep pushing is what got me to where I am today. Now, that being said, as I reflect back and I'm in a different phase where again, the stakes are a little lower for me, um, mm -hmm. but I'm still invested. I love working, so I'm always gonna be in the mix. Sure. For me now, I have very different priorities, very different balance, like a very different balance to my life. Is work a part of that? Absolutely. But is other things that tie into that health, wellness, family, friends, um, you know, hobbies was it something I never had. Yeah, hobbies, yeah, yeah. <laughs> got hobbies, you know. But like again, that took it took me going through that to get to here. Yeah. Um, and it's a very personal decision and choice you make, right? Like I think it's fine to have unbalanced pieces of your life. Right. Unbalanced, right. You know, season. To pursue a goal wholeheartedly, you inevitably, I think that's the problem. Like inherently to pursue a goal wholeheartedly, you have to be out of balance. That's exactly. why I think that word is jacked up. I totally agree. And like every interview I have or have had, I'm always very transparent about that because I, I say I was relentless about building yep. and selling this company. And right. that was from day one. It was day one. I was like a monster <laughs> for right. this company. Yeah. But again, I had to be. And they set me up for to be at a place in my life now where I pick and choose things. I, you know, have boundaries. There's specific things I do. I, I take time. I, yeah, I, that was not always the case. And I think that's important to share because I think social media has given this illusion and it's gotten a little bit better with the transparency of like CEO life and you're like hopping on plane to plane. It was like I was in Excel spreadsheets like right. totally <laughs> like, grinding, like, grinding, like, grinding, but loving it. That's what <laughs> and that's what I think is interesting about what I believe needs to be redefined, which is drive, because it, it is it is loving the grind. Kobe loved the grind. I, I think burnout is a result of aligning your behaviors with what doesn't matter to you. Exactly. If you are burning at both ends and grinding and hating every single minute of it, that's when it really ends badly. You know what sure. I mean? That's sure. I look back and I'm like, Again, I don't know how I did it, but I was like on 60 plus flights a year, but sure. I was loving every minute of it, like every win, every success. And I'm so happy I had that experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. All right. I want to dig into what you're doing now and some of the common threads at some level in your experiences, which is underrepresented founders appears to be right. This, this thread. Tell me a little bit about what's the most valuable piece of advice, right, that you've received throughout your all of these endeavors. And I want to unpack them all, right? But like, get me inside of what what's that what's that big aha silver bullet relative to to what you've learned throughout this journey? Gosh, I mean, there's so much, but I think like the most important thing is like anyone can be whatever they want. I think that's actually very true. You can do whatever you want. I did not have a business degree. I went to college for journalism. I had no connections in New York City when I moved there. There's no reason I should be as successful as I am. I am not like a networked, um, you know, Wharton grad. Right. That yeah. like, my parents are car dealers in Florida and I love them so much. But like, again, there's no, they, they still are like, what do you do? Right. <laughs> it really comes down to, and like, look, networking and stuff, all that stuff is very important. However, I think to your point, if you have the drive and the ambition and yeah. the will to get in the room, you can make it happen. And I yeah. see people do it all the time. Like I meet pe people very early in their entrepreneurial journey. And then I just see them skyrocket and I watch them and I, and the, the difference is, is they don't care what people think. Yep. They put themselves out there. They relentlessly pursue their dream, whatever that is, whether it's content creation, launching a product, whatever, and they push to make it happen. And I see it over and over and over again. And some of the most well-networked, well-meaning, well-whatever founders 
don't because again, the stakes aren't high for them. And so I think that is that common thread when it comes to building a business is that the people that I see really succeed are the ones that want it badly and have that drive. Mm -hmm. Totally. I mean, and, and at some level, I think, what do you tell people? What do you tell people when they say, well, I don't even really know what I want to go do. Like, what, 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 what's your advice to that with somebody who's listening going, yeah, but I don't even really know my jam, my purpose, my why, like give me inside. What, what, how do you sort of coach somebody through that? Yeah. I mean, I think experience begets planning, right? So you have to try a lot of different things. Like mm-hmm. I always tell people like I'll meet entrepreneurs who are like, you know, like for instance, like I have this chocolate chip cookie shop. It's amazing. I open this big chocolate chip cookie shop but like your cherry pie sells out every single day, not your cookies. It's like, pay attention. <laughs> totally. What's the thing where there's momentum? Like maybe you shouldn't have a chocolate chip cookie shop. You know what I mean? Yep. So it's like, go where the momentum is and like really like see what, again, what aligns with both like your passion, skill set, and momentum. Like that is the secret formula to building something really great. And that takes time to figure out. Like mm-hmm. I personally start businesses based off problems I've experienced. So I see something, for instance, I started my first company when I was very young as a female founder. Again, this is 10 plus years ago. Nothing online looked, felt, or spoke to me as a young millennial female founder. There was no Mm. conferencing event that looked like the events I wanted to go to. There was no one speaking that matched my age or um, the Mm -hmm. type of business Mm -hmm. I was in. And so I thought, hey, I'm gonna like try this out and try and put something together that feels a little different and see if people react to it cut to people reacted to it. People wanted it. They were very interested in it. So again, it was it a business day one. No, it was an idea. It was testing the ground of like, is this something that people could be interested in? And then similarly with Cherub, which is like my new company, I started mentoring and coaching entrepreneurs and every single call was about raising money or venture or funding and all these things. And I would say, listen, I don't think you're ready for venture capital quite yet. You're very early. Like, I think really, if you need a hundred, couple hundred thousand dollars, you should get angel investors. Mm-hmm. Every single call was would end with, great, where are the angel investors? And this <laughs> kept happening over and over again. I was like, I don't know. I think you can DM them on LinkedIn. Like, you know, it's like <laughs> there's no good answer, right? So basically in working um, with my co-founder, I told her about this and she was like, that's so interesting. She's like, on the flip side, I'm an angel investor and I get no deal flow because no one knows who I am. And so we kind of sat there and she was like, let's build a product to fix this. And so we literally did that where we now match angel investors and entrepreneurs. But again, it's a problem I experienced and understood. And from there built something around that. Mm -hmm. So pay attention to your everyday life. What's something that you wish was done a little bit better, a little bit differently that would make your life easier, but would also make lots of other people's lives easier, Mm -hmm. better, faster, more efficient. It's so cool that you say that because I, my husband and I have a 21 and 20 year old twin girls and they're constantly ideating companies because they see a problem in the market and they see a gap and then they sort of, I mean, the, the amount of prototype leggings, fast food ideas, right? But it's, it's anchored against exactly what you're saying, seeing a problem in the market and wanting to move forward and try to close the gap. Exactly. I love it. And, you know, Arthur Blank told me once who owns the Atlanta Falcons, I'm based here in Atlanta. He said, you know, if you follow your heart and you close a gap in the market, you're probably going to have some success, exactly. which is in part what you're saying. So I want to dig into create and cultivate. I mean, you, this is awesome, right? Like you build this thing from the ground up, you sell it, and then you buy it back. <laughs> yeah. Holy smokes. <laughs> What went into all of those decisions and and how has it all evolved relative to even your vision? Yeah, it's pretty wild. So essentially, I mean, it's like building the company from the ground up. I knew I always wanted to sell that business. And again, I knew that business was very sellable because we had a very specific niche for ambitious career women in this sector, media and events. Now, looking at the wider landscape on the, on the media front, like if you're looking at like a Condé Nast or a Hearst or whoever, the focus was really fashion, beauty, lifestyle, right? Like that's really where they, they're centered. And career was like kind of periphery. So I knew if we owned this category, there would be great strategic synergy down the line to acquire that business. Um, and lo and behold, that's essentially what happened. So we had some acquisition offers early on. It didn't quite work out. We were too new, too, too green, too all mm-hmm, that stuff. Mm-hmm. Then we, so basically we just keep building, growing, um, more profitable. Um, you know, we hit 14 million in revenue, bootstrapped, 4 million EBITDA, like extremely, like, and we are ready to go hit the, hit the ground running on a sale. COVID hits. 
So brutal. And you're in the events business. That's great. Brutal. So (laughs) that year, I mean, again, for every entrepreneur in in some way, shape or form was either really amazing or really horrible. Ours was down the middle, I would say, because what could have been a disastrous year actually ended up opening a lot of opportunity for us digitally. Um, We luckily had in place the framework for digital memberships, digital events. And so we moved very quickly and pivoted in that way. And our sponsors moved with us, which was very, very lucky. So we ended that year down on revenue, maintained EBITDA and had a good story to tell. From there, again, I was 10 plus years into the business. I did not know where the world was going. I don't think anyone did. We're like, were events coming back? We don't know, but we knew digital was where we were seeing the most traction. And so at that point, private equity came in. They were interested in building on the business, growing the digital side, and then hopefully one day ramping back up on events. Um, At that point, I, you know, I was like, I don't know if I'm the right CEO to run a digital media company. You know, my experience is um, limited in that way brought in an amazing CEO, sold the company to private equity, which was, again, a great exit for me, a great exit for some of my partners in the business. Felt like the right thing for the company, you know, going into this kind of unknown year of getting in the right experts and things like that. So from that point, I took a step back. I also transparently was, 2021 was brutal on everyone, but like self-care wise, you know, I was a mess. I was like, you know, trying to save this company, dealing with a global Mm -hmm. pandemic, blah, blah, blah. So I was ready for a break also as well. So took a few years off Um, in those few years, um, went and ran a $20 million fund for a family office, which was great. So got to really experience the venture capital side of the business. Um, Then went to the mentorship side of really like doing mentoring and coaching and launching um, the blueprint mastermind with Ali Webb and Marina Middleton. Learned a lot about that, kind of came into that business. But again, kind of also took some time off to like recenter and refigure out like who I am without this company, which is a whole other podcast. Sure. <laughs> when right. all identity is wrapped up in a business and then you all of a sudden are, um, you know, not really involved as much. Yeah. And then essentially um, the company boomerang back end of 2023. And I, again, never expected to do this where an opportunity arose where um, I could come back into the business. Um, what I realized was that company was not built for private equity. And I think a lot of people realize this like after the Mm. fact, you know, when it comes to it. And even yesterday I saw another article about, um, or Violet Gray buying back their company from private equity. And this, we see this a lot. Um, And so it's interesting because it wasn't that, it was really amazing lesson and lens into like how capital affects the business, how scale affects the business, how multiple people's opinion into a company again going from a self-funded company that didn't have a board to speak of like truly the vision was just me and a few like trusted partners and what that can do to a company that is really built on community right it's challenging it's really really challenging um and so i think you know i kind of came to the table and said i think i'm the best person to take this back i have sort of a new perspective on how we can move forward what Mm -hmm. i realized was after building the blueprint, which is a very small 50 person um, mastermind done twice a year, high price point, but really, really tiny compared to like the thousand person events we were doing was we were really missing that intimacy amongst entrepreneurs, but also we had not grown up with our girl. What I realized was, is we had always been in like launch mode. Like we're here for entrepreneurs. You're launching your business. You're going, you know, all that stuff. But the company was 12 plus years old at that time. And I look at even my journey of like starting the company to where I am now, like I need all new content. I need a totally different set of speakers. Like I need something different. So we really came back to the table with this concept of launch to legacy. And we thought we need to start building programming and content around the different life stages of entrepreneurship because you need different advice, different community, Mm -hmm. different speakers, Mm -hmm. different events for where you are, you know, if you're a company that's doing $200,000 in revenue, there's a specific type of content you're looking for to get you to that million dollar mark. Now, if you're a company doing 10 million in revenue, you're looking at your exit strategy and what your plan is, two totally different experiences that I've been through. And so we decided to kind of come in with this new vision, new set of um, ideas that we were really going to cultivate uh, for the community. And it's been, it's been amazing. It's an unbelievable, story and how cool that you were able to enter back in, repurpose it, scale it, grow it, and, and, and continue to pour into that baby, which at some level it is when you, totally. when you start, start a company. What are some of the trends that you're seeing as it relates to how people want to learn, how they want to consume content? 
Yeah. So it was really interesting. Pre-2020, I think we were in this uh, kind of heyday, right, of entrepreneurship where, you know, capital was really easy to come by. Um, there was really great exit stories happening left and right. And everyone was coming for inspiration, I would say. Like they wanted that inspiring story. They wanted to leave feeling good and motivated to go build their business. Post 2020, there's been a very significant shift. Mm -hmm. I think that the content that people are really relating to is very tactical around their business. People want to know, okay, great, you raised that much money. How did you do it? Why did you do it? Give me yeah. the, the A to Z of how I can do that as well. And so those really tactical workshop style um, speakers and content is what we're seeing really resonate and transparency. I mm -hmm. think, you know, previous to, again, 2020, people were like kind of like, you know, dancing around numbers, not really giving the full story. And, you know, now we're in this place where it's like, here's exactly what I'm spending on marketing. Here's the results I'm getting. Like that transparency is so incredible for entrepreneurs. Like I wish I had that when I was building my company, because you have no idea. You're kind of just like, shooting in the dark like do i do that much for marketing do i pay this person are we paying influencers is there roi you don't really know unless people are talking about it so yeah. now there's there's um tactical advice there's transparency um and there's just real conversations happening amongst these women again it's not from speaker to attendee it's from attendee to attendee as mm -hmm, well mm-hmm well, which that's i mean you're bringing these people together in a myriad of ways so that they can so that they can do that tell me about your newest business, right? I mean, an app that gives, I love it, ambitious founders, and as you alluded to earlier, a way to connect these two. What's the vision behind it and, and sort of the plan relative to pouring into both, both sides that, yeah. that clearly need this? I mean, it's sort of like a dating app, I guess, isn't it? it? Is. But, but, for, <laughs> but for something else. Exactly. So it, it really uses those dating app mechanics. So it's a double opt-in. I think on the angel side, what we heard was, one, I want really good deal flow. Two, I don't want to be inundated with deal flow that doesn't match like my criteria for investment, right? And that happens all the time. You get investment from people. You're like, I, like me personally, I tend to invest in underrepresented founders. 99% of my portfolio is that. I get pitches from white guys all the time. You know what yeah. I mean? But it's like, again, how do I kind of curate and delineate what I'm looking for? You know, I, if you're interested in AI, all those things, how do we curate that? So on that front, we're able to curate and sort of gate these angels, but we give them that great deal flow, they're able to connect. So what we found was, and just a good example during our beta, we promoted 40 brands through our community newsletter, et cetera. Of those 40 brands, 100% got pitch, uh, pitch deck views they otherwise would not have. Of that 100%, 50% were asked for intros, like they were interested in continuing wow. the conversation and get pitched. Of that 50%, 20% were funded in 90 days or less. So we realized, wow, like this is really working and people are writing checks. Since our inception, so August of last year to now September, over $2 million has been deployed to founders through Cherub Introductions. Wow. Crazy. So the that, capital's out there. Right. It's just they weren't getting the deal flow that they really wanted or needed in that way. So we're doing two things. One is we're getting founders funded, which is great. But two is we're converting angels, uh, converting new angels. So these are accredited investors who are interested in writing checks but have never written a check because they're not getting deal flow, has started writing their first couple checks through Cherub. And, and, and what, if any, role does this overlap relative to create and cultivate and any other, any, anything there? Totally. Well, obviously women get less than 2% of venture funding, so right. we're extremely underfunded in that way. Right. Um, however, what we're seeing, and it's really interesting, there's been a major uptick in female angel investors. So we're seeing that women tend to invest in women. So yeah. what's been awesome is of that $2 million, 80% has gone to underrepresented founders. So people of color or women. And that's not by nature of like us, you know, kind of, you know, uh, puppeteering that. That's just because these are great companies that need to get funded that otherwise aren't getting the opportunity or the seat at the table to get that investment. So the Crate and Cultivate community, obviously full of founders, but also full of funders. So it's really mm -hmm. exciting to tap into that and start seeing women invest in other women. I love of that what what would you tell a, 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 a young woman maybe under 30 right now that's has ideas wants to keep moving it, because you we see this all the time I mean it's one thing to have a great idea yeah. it's one thing to see a gap in the market it's one thing to sort of want to close that gap and it's a whole nother thing 
to take action on that in a way that results in something that is in fact substantive, that is in fact scalable, and then one day sellable. What, how, do you, how do you unpack that for somebody in a way that's tactical and actionable for them? I think it really comes down to proof of concept. So again, you can have an idea, you can think something will be great, but unless you have proof of concept, it's really challenging to go to market with something like that. And again, proof of concept doesn't mean you have to go out and build it and sell it and do all these things. Cherub's a really good example. We had this idea, we thought it could be interesting. We launched an email list, that's it. It was a splash page that said, are you interested in getting deal flow in your inbox? Just to see, are people interested in getting deal flow in their inbox? No paid marketing, no nothing. Within two weeks, we had 1,500 signups. So we knew wow. people wanted deal flow. We used that to then build an alpha product ourselves, my co-founder and I, using no-code platforms just to see like, okay, let's build this like kind of uh, like, um, like sort of a put together little like alpha product that again, didn't have to pay a developer millions of dollars, just said, let's create an email list that drives you to this flow that then drives you to an intro and see what happens. From there, we were able to launch the beta product. And from that alone, the email list to the creation of that product, me and my co-founder only, we raised $1.7 million. Wow. Based off just that interest and that momentum. Right. So again, free, technically, like just create momentum, figure out, is this something people want? And then right. use that to get capital, to, to build something, to bring on a partner, whatever it might be. So yeah. I think a lot of tools are at your disposal now that we just frankly didn't have. Sure. Um, you know, one of the things I always tell, especially product founders who are like, I'm really interested in launching this product, but like don't want to upfront uh, cash right. flow a bunch of inventory, do a pre-order, launch a pre-order, get that capital in, then buy the product and test it out. So there's a lot of different ways you can kind of create that momentum and, and again, product market fit without having to have millions of dollars or tons of connections. What, what if it's something that, yeah, like if it's a product, but you wanna, you wanna sort of throw it out there and get actual people to sort of wear it, use it, taste it, what, whatever that might be in, in a way that you can do it sort of in that beta form, like you said, without you know, running a thousand prototypes and putting them in the mail. And so the people, you know, I mean, how, how do you sort of coach people on that? I think really honestly, like you have to get a ton of feedback at the beginning and it's hard because you're like yeah. obsessed and in love with what you're right. doing, of course, <laughs> but you really need to. And I, even with yeah, pitching so and good. doing a deck, that first like pitch that we did with Cherub, again, this was an investor that we weren't even that excited about, wasn't that great of a fit, but honestly, thank God we did that because they gave us such good feedback on like, okay, I don't think you're presenting the problem early enough. And like, you really need to lean into X, Y, and Z. Getting that feedback was invaluable to securing the investment we actually needed and wanted in that way. So I think again, just like information is so valuable at the beginning mm -hmm. of building your business. So again, go small scale. Don't order a thousand things at the right. gate. Get a small subset, get people you trust that are in the industry or relevant to what you're building and yeah. get feedback to start before you do a deep dive into spending tons of money into something that might not work or might not be the best fit. Mm -hmm. It's back to that curiosity word, right? Yeah. I mean, essentially that's what you're saying. Peel it back, dig in. This is such good stuff. And so how do people relative to create and cultivate Cherub, how do they how do they step into some of these experiences and or opportunities with both of these? I mean, these are great. And, and, yeah. and, and of course, some of the other businesses that you're investing in. So many. Um, so yeah, so Create and Cultivate, sign up for our newsletter. We have a ton of events coming up. We have a bunch at the end of the year. And then in 2025, we're launching our first ever festival, which we're calling Coachella for Career Women. It's going to be amazing. Awesome speakers. We have Center Court, which is going to be our women in, um, women in sports area. We're going to have our um, content campground, which is all content related um, content, small business market, so many different things. It's going to be awesome. So just sign up for our newsletter or follow us on social at Create Cultivate. And for Cherub, go to investwithcherub.com. You can sign up as an angel investor or you can sign up as a founder and get our access to our deal flow newsletter. We do a ton of events all over the country. So if you're looking to connect and learn more about fundraising in general or angel investing, definitely check it out. That's awesome. All right, girl, we end with rapid fire. So I'm gonna hit you with some quick yeah, ones. You move okay. pretty quick. So I think this is gonna be, this is gonna be a, a slam dunk. So who is a female founder that inspires you now and why? Oh my gosh, there's so many that I like invest in. It's going to be hard to pick. Um, <laughs> let me think. Well, you know, I actually just um, interviewed Kim Perel. I don't know if you know Kim Perel. She's absolutely amazing. Um, we got connected. This is rapid fire, so I'll be fast. But I would say Kim Perel. It's Burrell, great. It's great. Awesome. Tell me why. Tell me why. It's okay. We're good. 
so we were able to connect um, through an investment that we made together. And I just think she's so incredible what she's done and like in her industry and she just pays it forward to women. And her social media is amazing. She's so good at it. I'm like, I aspire to be as good as you are at social Aww. media. But Kim Perel, if you don't know her, follow her. She's awesome. That's awesome. Who's your favorite female founded brand or what is your favorite female founded brand? Oh my gosh. I mean, some of the investments I have, I'll give you a few. Um, Ceremonia, which is a brand founded by Baba. It's awesome. It's um, essentially hair care for curly haired girls. I'm also <laughs> invested in Live Tinted, which is an amazing um, makeup brand for uh, women of color by Deepika Muyala, amazing founder. Um, Chill House by Cindy Ramirez, nail company. I also just recently invested um, in Intro, which is cool, and um, which I'm personally on as a platform. And then also... Crown Affair with Diana Cohen. She's awesome. That's good stuff. So what is your most memorable career moment so far? Like what's the, I mean, like what's the most, the moment when you went, wow, this is epic. Yeah. I, I feel like it was when I interviewed Martha Stewart in New York city. Um, mm -hmm. it was so awesome. She was so cool. She was a get I wanted for a very long time and she just was unbelievable. Such a great interview, lots of fun. Um, and she was just great to be around. That's really cool. I mean, what's cool about that is that it wasn't when you sold your company for a bunch no, of money. Exactly. It no. wasn't when you, I mean, it, it wasn't when you, you know, realized again, I mean, it was, it was a moment and it was a connection and it was a relationship and that's, what I think is so important for young women to hear, for other people to hear that, that it isn't these moments of achievement and isolated success that in fact fill us up. No. It's all the little things along the way and what that drips out for us to experience. Totally, yeah. Selling a company is actually really anticlimactic. It's the most amazing moment <laughs> right. of your life. Like when the wire hits, it's so exciting. But in terms of the feeling you have, it's yeah. very strange because you just like go back to work the next day. Right. <laughs> You're just right. like, oh, still doing laundry, still going to work, still. It's like very, it's a very surreal feeling. Yeah. And I love it. So what are you reading or watching or listening to right now that's Ooh, inspiring I you, that's, that's, that's making a difference in your life? You know, I, I've been like less on the business books, more on the personal books. I've been reading um, The Body Keeps the Score, which I don't know if you know that book, but it's really interesting about how all the things in our life affect our physical body. And again, that plays into business as well. It's like sure. the things that you take on and that you experience and how to do that. Um, it's funny because I feel like sometimes when I'm listening or reading to things, it's like because I'm in business mode all day, I need to disconnect and do something totally different. Totally, like, totally. Show or like, you know, whatever. Right. Or garden, like I heard you got into. That's a riot. Yeah. I love it. All right. So the show's called Game Changers. So who or what is a game changer who inspires you and why? Ooh, I would say my, my uh, partner on Create and Cultivate, Marina Middleton. She's awesome. She's been such a force for the last few years that we were able to connect and meet. And so now we're doing Create and Cultivate 2.0 together. Wow. And her renewed energy and spirit and like the way that she approaches things, it, it reinvigorates me to be excited again about what we're building. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Good for you. Good for her. Yeah. She yeah. sounds, she's awesome. She seems super awesome. Jacqueline, thanks for coming on. This was super fun. I appreciate Yay! it. Thanks for having me. This was awesome. Love it. Love it. Yeah.